Now, there is a, a story that's told about a town located at the base of a mountain range. And the people there in this town received wonderful water as it worked its way down from these tall mountains. Now, up in the mountains, there was a man there, and his title was the Keeper of the Spring. And it was, you see, his responsibility to make sure that that stream at its source was always completely clean and clear. You see, it was his job to, to take away any dead leaves that might fall into that water source, he, any, any twigs that might fall there, especially were an animal to die, he would quickly make sure he got that away from the water source. And then, of course, the townspeople at the bottom of the mountain would have just this beautiful, wonderful, delightful, clear drinking water and water to water their lawns and everything else they might do with water. But you see, one year, this town... They had a budget crisis. Things weren't going as good as they thought financially. And they started going down that budgetary list, wondering, where can we, where can we maybe make some cuts? So they decided, we're going to cut the salary of this keeper of the springs, and unfortunately, we're going to have to let him go. But they said, we'll probably still have clean water anyhow, right? That's what they said to themselves anyhow. And for a couple of days after he had been dismissed, the water kept flowing clear and clean. But after the third day, there was a, an odor. And on the fourth day, it was starting to turn a little green. And on the fifth day, there were distinct little bubbles in there that didn't belong in your drinking water. And people began getting sick. And they said, you know, maybe we better reinstall the keeper of the spring. And when they did, within just a few short days, the water was pure and clean once again. The gospel of Jesus Christ must constantly be guarded. See, we as followers of Jesus have the responsibilities, so to speak, to be the keepers of the spring, to, to make sure that, that clear water, the, the clearest, cleanest water of life flows freely. That the clear message of the cross continues to go forth with clarity and transforming power. For the next few weeks, probably the month of May and, and into the month of June, we are embarking on a journey together here at Glory Baptist Church through a sermon series that I've titled Legacy. Leaving a Legacy. What do you want your legacy to be? When we were out in the graveside yesterday as I walked through performing the funeral, officiating there, I noticed on those headstones, names, maybe a little information, if they were soldiers and what war, a year that they were born, sometimes even a date that they might have been born. And there was a dash. See, each and every one of us has been given a dash. And that dash is going to dictate what your legacy will be. We all know at the end, there's going to be another number. That day will soon come for each and every one of us. But if we handle that dash properly, our legacy doesn't end with that last number, does it? Our legacy can carry on. It can continue on. It can go on for even generations, in fact. But we have to be intentional about cultivating our legacy. It won't happen by accident. And as a church here at Glory Baptist Church, one of the things that we have been foundationally built on from the very beginning, it's part of our DNA, it's part of who we are as Converge, it's part of who we were when they used to call us the Baptist General Conference, it's part of who we were back when they used to call us the Swedish Baptists. I'm not even Swedish. I was a German Lutheran. But even so... One of the foundational principles, the foundational principle, in fact, is the gospel, the good news, 
of Jesus Christ. It was there when the first people gathered just a quarter mile down the road to start Glory Baptist Church. It is here today, and it is my prayer that it will continue on as long as this church lasts, hopefully until, hopefully until Christ comes again, in fact, that as people gather here under the name of glory, it will be to the end of guarding and growing and giving the gospel. But that's not always easy, is it? You see, throughout history, there have been many attacks that have come against Christianity. Many ways in which the stream has been attempted, or in fact at times been, polluted and become unclear. For example, if you know church history, you know in the early centuries came a a challenge against the church called Gnosticism. And, 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 And the Gnostics had synthesized this Greek philosophy of their time with Christianity and created a warped and perverted version of the gospel. If you've ever read the book or seen the movie The Da Vinci Code, that's about a Gnostic gospel. We saw also early in the church's history, uh, in the early centuries, uh, forms of sacramentalism. And and sacramentalism is the idea that, that grace is given to you through the sacraments. And so in a sense, then, the church was the holder of salvation. And, and, and the holder of that salvation the parishioners wanted, it, it held in their hands. And it had power and control to manipulate people because of it. And as long as you participated then and, and followed the rules and, and did as you were told according to the sacraments, then you could receive certain benefits. Uh, But the problem with that was you never knew exactly if you had received quite enough, right? If you had done enough to be right with God. I mean, what's the difference between a mortal and a venial venial sin? And and there was differences of opinions within even that. How how, how does this get categorized? Uh, Will this sin condemn me for eternity? Or or is this the kind of sin that, that can be easily forgiven? And people were keeping score. And then you had other things that have come along, like scientism and rationalism. And and of course, we don't have time to list each and every one of these challenges and attacks against the gospel. But many have been made in different ways throughout the history of the church. So, to get started, we're going to jump into Galatians 1, 3 through 9. If you have a Bible, feel free to pull it out. There's some in the pews. Uh, you can use your iPhones. If you've got an iPad, if you've got an Android, uh, version is a very good version of an online Bible. If you don't have an online Bible, version Y-O-U, version. I think if you go to Bible.com, it redirects you to version. If you don't have a Bible, if you don't personally own a Bible and you're here today, on our Welcome Center are some blue Bibles. Take one. Really? Take one. Take two if you really want. Take them. Keep them. They're yours. They're a gift from us to you. And, and I'll readily replenish them. I've got another, I'm down to like 35 of them in my office. So it's my joy to give them away. I bought them by the case for the intention of just giving them away. So if you need a Bible, feel free to take one. We're glad to give those away. But we're going to be in Galatians 1, 3 through 9 as our primary verse today. And as we look at this Galatians 1, 3 through 9, it comes to me the belief that the Apostle Paul was the keeper of the spring of the gospel, if I can continue that idea. And this is what Paul says about the gospel. Paul says this to the churches of Galatia. Paul says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of God and Father, to whom the glory will be forever and ever. Amen. And then Paul continues on and he says, he says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him, God, who called you to the grace of Christ, and that you are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, he says. But there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if if we, Paul says, or even if an angel, Paul says, an angel from heaven should come to you and preach a gospel contrary to the one that we had preached to you, let him be accursed, Paul says. 
If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one that you received, let them be accursed. Paul, you see, says, keep the gospel stream clear. Keep it clean. And if we're going to do that, it seems to me then that it must be critical for us to have a full understanding of what exactly is the gospel. So as we kick off talking about a legacy, and our legacy that we're talking about today is guarding the gospel, I, I want to define the gospel, and I'm going to give you some, some phrases that, if you feel so led, you could write them down. There's a, if you've got a bulletin. I've even gone to the arduous length of giving you places to write stuff. I even numbered them for you. It's like I did your homework. But if you'd like to take notes, there, there is a place for notes in the Bible. And as we look at this and as we define the gospel, I do believe it is critical, critical, the bedrock for our understanding of who it is that we are in Christ. So I'm going to give you some, some statements that I think are important statements, and feel free to write these down. First of all, the first thing I want you to know is that God took the initiative to reconcile us to himself. See, we, we already read that in, in verses 3 and 4 a moment ago. And it is God who himself gave Christ for us, right? See, God took the initiative and, and the reason that God had to do this is, is very simple, frankly. It's because you and I are sinners, right? And we are sinners who cannot save ourselves. You see, our goodness cannot be added to the gospel. And it's good to be good, don't get me wrong. But our own personal good, it's not good enough. And it's critical for us to understand that because the Bible is very clear and it says that all, each and every one of us, all have fallen short of the glory of God. It says right there in Romans. It says all. That means pastors. That means priests. That means Sunday school teachers. That means my mom, and she's pretty dang close to being a saint. But even my mom falls short of the glory of God, right? Right? Most of you haven't met my mom, but when you meet her, you'll believe me. But we've fallen short of the glory of God, and our goodness cannot add to the goodness of God. In fact, our goodness is like filth compared to the glory of God. And Paul tries to draw our attention to that frequently. And so statement number one is simply that God took the initiative upon himself to reconcile us to himself... Because if he hadn't, we'd be lost. We cannot save ourselves. We'll talk about that more here in a little while as we celebrate communion. Point number two. Jesus came to the earth to die. And when he died, upon him was laid God's judgment for all sins, for all who would believe in him. See, Jesus took the entire hit, the whole thing, right? And, and that's why at the very end, as he was hanging from the cross, he could say, it is finished. His work was done. He did it all. That's why we sing the song, right? Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Right? Some of you youngsters hopefully still know that too. Jesus paid it all. He died for my sake. To bring me to God. Paul says that Jesus who gave himself for our sins... And as a result of that, he took it entirely, not partially, but entirely. He took eternally upon himself my brokenness, our sin. It was laid upon him, and he paid it all, wrote the check that we could not write 
for all who would believe in his name. And that leads me to the third point. The third point as we talk about guarding the gospel and understanding what that means is we need to understand that the gospel is a good and glorious gift that comes to us from God. See, like I said, our righteousness is good, but it's not good enough in this case. Our, our own personal righteousness doesn't qualify. It, 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 we have to take our righteousness and set it to the side, in fact. And God, God looks at us and says, your righteousness will not save you. You are unworthy because you're tainted and broken by your sin. And that's why we have to receive Jesus' righteousness. And that righteousness, as we receive it, is received as a gift. Given to us freely, no strings attached. A gift that we receive simply by faith. It is received by faith, and then not just an intellectual faith, but a transfer of trust on our part. You see, when, when you come to Jesus, right? When you, when you come to Jesus to be saved, or, or some will say, as you come to be born again, right? That's a phrase many have used. You don't, you don't get to say, well, I'm going to trust Jesus a little bit. And the rest I'm going to do, right? Do we get to do that? No. The Bible's very clear. We don't. We don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't get to determine how much or how little we're going to take and give. Because, you see, it has nothing to do with us. See, we can't fix these problems. We're the ones who created the mess, right? You ever, you ever been working on your computer? <laughs> All of a sudden, that blue screen of death shows up. You remember those back in the olden days? You're like, what did I do? And the computer freezes and you lose however many hours of work you've just done because you, like me, are not smart enough to save. Jesus saves, but we don't. Right? It's true. I lost a term paper that way once. And so you, you see this confounded screen. And more often than not, I'm a kind of tech-savvy guy, but I have no idea what I did to cause this thing to crash. Or, or why did my phone just lock up, right? Or why does that light on my car keep blinking at me? I didn't do anything to my car. What's wrong with it? I treat it well, don't I? But you see, we're the ones who messed it up, and more often than not, we have no clue how. We just know that we did. And worse yet, when it comes to our sin, we often do know how we messed it up, right? We, we, we are aware, for the most part, of how we sin. And in fact, sometimes we intentionally even uh, choose to sin. And if that is the case, that means we can't fix that problem on our own. We need some help. And I know that frustrates some people, right? It frustrated me when I was not yet a believer. You see, I, I thought I could be better than that guy. As if that guy was the standard. But if I'm better than him, or if, if I'm not as bad as her, or if, if, if I do a little bit more than they do, God's going to grade on a curve, right? I mean, I might not be a D student, but a C should get me a cloud in heaven, right? Wrong. It's a pass-fail. God doesn't grade on a curve. And we bring nothing to it. In fact, what we do bring, our contribution to our salvation, is our sin. That's all we have to give. We haul in this bag of wretched sin, right? And Jesus brings in this glorious bag of perfect righteousness. And he looks at us and says, Here, want to trade? You should say yes. The great exchange. 
So it's this great trust that we have to have. And it's an exclusive trust. Anyone who receives Christ as Savior recognizes that He is the only way. That there is no other option out there. That there is no other name under heaven that has been given that man can be saved. And so our transfer of trust isn't just that little, and the rest is mine. No, it's jumping into the chasm. It's jumping overboard. It's both feet jumping full on in. It's a recognition that, that we are in need of a Savior. And then accepting that gift. Your parents can't do it for you, though they wish they could. It didn't miraculously happen when you were baptized. It's not as if, you, I mean, you know, that the, you found the entry point and now you get to coast along, right? No, that's not how it works. We come to Christ broken and receive exclusively His righteousness. And then what happens after that, and this is your number four point if you're keeping score at home. What happens then is this gift that God gives us results in transformation. Because it not only means that that God declares me to be righteous, but in addition to that, then the Holy Spirit of God comes to dwell within me, coming into my life to change me from within. Now, it may not always be an immediate change. For some of us, it takes a while, right? I, I was one of those. Came a Christian, became a Christian when I was 19 in college. And boy, do I wish God would have fixed me and made me clean and perfect. And I would have been just the best boyfriend ever. And I would have been the best friend ever and the best student ever because, man, life would have been good. But the problem is that's not what God did. God gave me his grace. And it took a number of years for me to quit being a knucklehead. And I'm still a work in progress, if we're honest. For some people, I have a friend. I have a pastor friend. Man, does he have a story. See, he used to run some bars in the Twin Cities. He was a manager of this particular bar in St. Paul, and out of the back he used to deal drugs. And he had done so for quite some time and made a good living and had a lot of fun. And then one day, somehow, some way, God penetrated through his darkness. The light of Jesus Christ arrived in his life. And in one day, he went from dealing drugs out of the back of the bar that he ran to walking into his owner's office, quitting, with no future job prospect in mind, with no discernible skill other than dealing drugs. And he walked out of his boss's office knowing he was a new man made in Christ and that God would take care of him somehow, some way. And now, 20 years later, he started four churches and works now helping others to start new churches to the glory of God. So sometimes it is amazing like that, and sometimes you got to put in the work like me. But either way, God through the Holy Spirit comes to us through the gospel to transform us. That is God's desire for us. That as we begin to love Jesus, we begin to love his word, more deeply. We begin to love his people more deeply. We begin to love the bride of Christ, his church, more deeply. And there is a transformation that begins to take place. Now that's the gospel. And of course, we have all kinds of aberrations from that that are taught in various, various places. The Apostle Paul said it in his own very words. He said, there are those who will come and they will distort the gospel, right? See, the folks in Paul's day were distorting the gospel because they were mixing it with works, right? They thought they could do enough in addition to the gospel to earn their way to heaven. That was the problem of Paul's time. We still have that problem today. That was one among many. Let me give you a couple of others that that, that we struggle with in our time. 
that distract us from the true gospel. One that I hear a lot about. One that comes up in my Facebook feed here and there and everywhere from time to time is the idea of a social justice gospel. See, there's, there's whole conferences that are held on the social justice gospel. And, and these whole conferences can go on talking about the social justice and never get to the gospel. That's a sad state. In the social justice gospel, sin is largely defined as uh, sin in, in a corporate setting, sin in corporate terms. It's things like racism and materialism and economic diversity. Now, should we be interested in those things? Absolutely, we should. We should be involved at the forefront, in fact, of, of helping people get out of a hole in life. We should be at the very front of the argument for why all are created one and equal in Christ. We should be there at the beginning. But we should be there as a fruit of the gospel. We are there loving and serving and standing as a fruit of the gospel. But those things themselves are not the gospel, and we must be clear. If it isn't about Jesus dying on the cross for sinners who need to be saved, then it's not of the gospel. So we have to be careful that we don't get distracted by that. Another danger in our time and age is the idea of the ecumenical gospel. There's a lot of pressure right now in our world, in our culture, for this, right? I mean, who do you think you are telling me that other religions aren't right? There's multiple paths to God, right? Isn't there? We're, we're, we're all worshiping the same God, just differently. You heard those? I hear those. I have a lot of friends who are not followers of Christ, who think somehow, some way, through some other avenue or channel, that they may or might somehow have a relationship with the one true God. And there's a lot of pressure that comes from them in our culture and society for us as Christians to say, well, you know, yeah, maybe we can open the door for you just a little bit and make an exception because you're, 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 you're close. You're kind of like us. I see that you're genuine in your worship, right? I can genuinely believe that today is Wednesday. That doesn't make me right. And so this ecumenical gospel, it challenges us. But let me, let me speak with some clarity, candidly, to you within that. See, we, we as Christians should never be proud. Oh yeah, I picked the right team. Or, or God picked me for the right team, depending on your theology. Right? Did God choose us or did we choose him? Well, let's not get into that today because, well, I don't wear a watch. But, as Christians, we should be the least prideful people in all of the world. See, if you and I come across as arrogant, we do not represent Jesus well. And the reason that we believe that this is the truth, that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life, and that, that only through him may we come to the Father, the reason for that is, is it's about Jesus. It's not about us. Therefore, I have no place for pride within that. He is the Savior. I am not. He is the only one who can take away my sin. I cannot. He is the only one who died, went to the grave, rose, and ascended to heaven. I did not. Therefore, I should have no pride for something I did not do. See, it's all about Jesus. And, and we can't crack open that door for the ecumenical gospel. You see, the Bible and Jesus make some very strong and clear truth claims. We either accept or we reject 
who Jesus says that he is. Now here's my prayer for you. It comes from Philippians 1 verse 27. If you've got your Bible open, underline it. If you're using your phone, don't use pen. But Philippians 1.27 says, Only let the manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to see you, Paul says, whether I come to see you or, an abs- or an, an, am in absence, either way, he says, that I might hear of you, that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, that you might indeed live worthily. That you might stand united and fight willingly or accordingly. If you didn't study Greek like I did, and I say study, I had four years of it and I learned about one year of it. I paid for all four years, but I did not get my money's worth. But if you studied Greek, the Greek word for striving is actually two words kind of crammed together. Greek is really good about doing that. And the first word is soon, and the second word is atleto, like athletes, right? And Paul envisions us as a warrior, us as believers, as a warrior, standing firm, back to back, side to side with our brothers and sisters in Christ, ready to fight for that which we believe. But we don't, we don't stand there as ones with pride. No, we, we stand there in our brokenness, in our humility. We stand there not as warriors with weapons, but warriors of the gospel, with arms outreached, saying to our brothers and sisters, we are simply beggars who have found a bit of bread. Come and eat. There's plenty. Come and eat. That is what the gospel is about. That is what we, as people of the gospel, must be about. My desire is that as long as this church exists, as long as I draw breath, that we will proclaim and deeply believe in the transforming power of the gospel here at Glory Baptist Church. And that as we do that, it will help us leave a lasting legacy. We all get one of those dashes on our headstone. What are we going to do with it? What you believe matters, folks. It matters in the here and now, and it can matter for eternity. It can matter in your life, and it can matter for generations to come. So it is critical as our launching point in this sermon series that we get this right. Because it's the gospel that changes hearts. It's the gospel that is our most precious possession. It is the gospel that America and our world so desperately needs. There is a God in heaven with whom we can be reconciled. A God in heaven who gives us his perfect gift. But if we don't share it, if we don't care about it, if we neglect it, if we ignore it, it does us no good. And our legacy will be diminished. So with that, we're going to enter in just a moment into prayer. And we're going to sing a song and we're going to take communion. And as we go about that today, as I'm praying, I will invite you to join in with me for a moment. Think about what you want your legacy to be. Think about who God has put into your life, or maybe they haven't yet. Maybe God is going to put them in your life. Who you need to reach, who you need to impact, who you need to show as a beggar who has found bread where you found that bread. Let us pray.